So, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining, and uh, we're back for part two of the OPC FX series. And uh, uh, excited to sort of go deeper into this topic. And uh, and again today I have with me uh, Chhatrapati, and uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, implementing OPC UA FX into machines and uh, into more details of how this can come about. And uh, and yeah, as you remember, I think uh, in the previous session, it was all about more or less the 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 understanding the key aspects of OPC UAFX, the the benefits, the advantages, and the current state, right? Like, and uh, that basically was uh, to set the tone to in terms of getting into a little more detail as we move forward with the subsequent sessions. So, so again, just a a background to this whole initiative. Uh, this is a webinar series that we're doing in collaboration with uh, BNR Automation as well as uh, Schneider Electric, and uh, the the objective is to sort of spread the word with of OPC UAFX and how uh, the the whole uh, implementation can come about, and at the same time uh, have more OEMs and industrial uh, uh, machine builder OEMs as well as uh, automation OEMs to, to collaborate and 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 grow this uh, this sort of initiative and and improve the the adaptation of OPC UFX. So uh, so I think I'll not take too much time to sort of go go through the basics of it. So we will get get into the details. So uh, this session again will run for about 45 minutes and uh, we'll have time for a Q&A. So uh, feel free to drop in any questions you may have in the comment section. And we'll we'll try to sort of address them then and there, and uh, and yeah. So in terms of uh, I think uh, just a quick uh, recap in terms of where what we went through in the previous session a couple of weeks ago. So we basically spoke about uh, uh, what the future of industrial automation technology looked like, and uh, in terms of uh, where OPC UAFX fits in and the different uh, uh, advantages and benefits that it could sort of offer to uh, the the discrete automation uh, industry itself. Right? And of course, uh, with realizing those benefits, of course, there are some key considerations that we'll have to take into consideration. And uh, that's when we went about highlighting different cases in terms of brownfield and greenfield uh, in use cases, right? So um, we'll, we'll leave a link to the previous session, uh, and if you have uh, a chance, please do uh, go through that, and uh, and I'm sure that will uh, set the tone to what we want to talk about in a little more detail today. So I think uh, uh, before we get into the details of how do you go about the 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 embark on the journey of OPC OFX implementation into machines, uh, I think we we'll, let, let's understand a little more on the different. I would say uh, aspects of OPC UFX and how uh, this this particular uh, breakdown of different uh, things came about and 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 sort of uh, go from there. So I think over to you, Chhatrapati, if you can give us some details on that. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So uh, OPC UFX is basically uh, uh, extensions to existing uh, uh, core OPC UFX. Uh, specification so these extensions help in uh, adapting opca into uh, the lower levels uh, where uh, uh, different communication uh, models can be achieved uh, in terms of uh, machine to machine communications and uh, controller to uh, compute or uh, between controllers and uh, even to the uh, lower level where a controller can uh, speak to devices uh, as well. Uh, to achieve this, there are uh, uh, several uh, aspects and uh, with respect to each of these uh, uh, aspects, the extensions have been uh, uh, defined and some extensions are still uh, it's a work in progress where uh, uh, different uh, extensions are being expanded uh, further. So uh, the, there are uh, several uh, key extensions in the area of uh, information model. Uh, different information models have been uh, uh, defined to uh, have this uh, field level uh, data exchange between 
different assets uh, and uh, the communication model has been defined on how uh, this uh, communication establishment monitoring of the communication and uh, maintaining it and so on and uh, different uh, network uh, services uh, as well such as uh, uh, discovering the uh, topology or identifying uh, the assets on the uh, network and uh, using time synchronization mechanisms to have more deterministic uh, data exchange uh, and so on and uh, uh, to have a deterministic communication uh, tsn has been adapted so uh, it's uh, uh, it has been uh, there on the um, it and other uh, uh, network applications and uh, adopting uh, tsn for the opc afx uh, communications has uh, uh, enabled the applications to have uh, deterministic uh, time bound and uh, uh, time bound data exchange uh, and this allows all the uh, time critical applications like uh, motion control and so on and uh, security so uh, opc itself has a very uh, strong security features already built in and, and opc fx uh, provides extensions on how this uh, security uh, infrastructure can be extended into field level and uh, other network uh, communications that are a part of the opc uh, fx so basically it allows uh, all the um, uh, basic features of encryption authentication data integrity and uh, um, protection against uh, any other uh, cyber threads that are out there and uh, most importantly the uh, the opc security itself uh, uh, is a continuous uh, evolving uh, aspect of it this is again based on in in generic uh, uh, cyber security whatever the improvements that are happening uh, based on that uh, the adaptation is uh, is a continuous improvement that happens to OPCA security and the same uh, has been extended to OPCA uh, FX as well. And uh, interoperability is a uh, very uh, strong feature. So this ensures uh, uh, cross vendor interoperability uh, so that uh, uh, controllers and devices from multiple vendors can uh, coexist in the uh, same uh, system and uh, talk to each other seamlessly. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, early adopters or OPC AFX are uh, doing rigorous uh, interoperability testing uh, with uh, by attending different uh, plug fests and other uh, events uh, building prototypes and demos uh, where uh, devices and implementations from multiple vendors are being integrated and uh, showcased uh, as well then controller profile uh, this is again specific to uh, controllers so there is a, a reason why uh, controllers are chosen uh, to be the initial uh, 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 initial prototypes and development uh, for opc fx so the profile have been already uh, defined for uh, controllers and other extensions are being uh, defined and other profiles are being worked on uh, related to motion control, different instrumentations, IOs, and uh, so on. So with all these uh, extensions, uh, OPC AFX is uh, uh, really set for having a, a, a complete entry and communication based on uh, rich information models from uh, sensor to cloud. And uh, as part of this, uh, there is a uh, uh, there's a communication model that has been uh, uh, defined uh, as part of the OPCA uh, extension. And uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, there are different uh, possibilities, and each possibility brings out uh, or addresses uh, several different uh, new age use cases that are uh, required to be addressed. So, uh, for example, when you look at uh, controller to uh, compute, uh, different 
dashboards, asset performance monitoring applications, predictive uh, maintenance applications, uh, different uh, uh, performance monitoring and optimization related applications, uh, energy aware or energy conscious applications and uh, emission predictions, these type of uh, use cases uh, uh, becomes possible uh, with controller to uh, compute uh, a communication model and uh, running any sort of AI based uh, algorithms and applications on the data that is available at a, at a compute platform uh, becomes easy because uh, uh, the information model, uh, the entire context of the data is uh, preserved uh, throughout the uh, transition and communication. There is no uh, mapping or there is no protocol adapter or uh, there is no filtering or processing of the data that uh, happens. And uh, when you look at uh, controller to controller, uh, again, uh, this enables a lot of use cases uh, in the machine uh, industry. So where uh, uh, these machines are being built uh, for a specific application by different machine builders who have uh, their own strong area based on uh, different applications. So uh, they're being custom built with uh, components from different vendors supporting different data models and different uh, communication protocols and different uh, even physical layers to connect and so on. So uh, uh, having an interoperable communication between a machine to a machine to enable a much intelligent uh, production line uh, where the supervisory controls doesn't have to worry about each and everything uh, uh, opens up a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of efficiency, interoperability, uh, and so on. So uh, this enables a lot of uh, use cases for uh, machines and uh, other uh, subsystems integration. And then uh, controller to device, these are uh, very uh, normal use cases, I would data exchange, safety data, motion control, um, everything happens uh, here. Uh, this is uh, normal uh, scenarios that are already have been there. Uh, but that is again now possible with uh, OPC AFX. And then uh, compute to uh, compute. This is again now uh, when you have uh, different compute platforms running uh, different applications uh, with their own way of uh, uh, communicating and uh, different types of uh, messaging uh, structures and data models, it becomes really uh, difficult to exchange information between uh, multiple uh, compute applications. So uh, with OPC AFX adaptation, uh, that becomes uh, very much seamless and interoperable uh, as well. Uh, device to compute cases. Yeah, I think we're just having some technical issues, so just bear with us, please. Uh, is where so the cases, uh, the controller. Uh, include uh, different uh, diagnostics and condition monitoring or sharing the audit logs and uh, any other uh, smart instruments collecting uh, uh, condition monitoring uh, parameters and uh, sharing with the compute platform directly. And then the last one is device to device communication. Uh, there are very uh, some cases where uh, 
um, having the information exchange between uh, devices where devices can uh, do a localized action which de doesn't depend on uh, the controller uh, input or intervention. So this enables uh, possibility for uh, such applications and use cases as well. Great. So I think uh, uh, we we pretty much saw the different possibilities and the the key sort of uh, extensions from the the standard OPC UI spec, right? In terms of what entails OPC UI FX. I think before we sort of uh, discuss or understand in terms of how it is implemented into machines, finally, right? I think uh, it'll be good to give understand uh, uh, a full picture of a typical machine and, and where it stands and then sort of go into a little more detail. So if you can help us uh, look at the bigger picture and then break it down, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, we are just uh, looking at a, a typical machine uh, architecture and then uh, the components uh, that it has and uh, these components are the specific machine architecture when you map it to any example like a packing machine or something then you get a little more meaning or uh, understanding out of what what um, each of these component is uh, there for and what it does so uh, these are uh, typically the uh, different components uh, uh, that are part of a uh, machine maybe we can take an example say packing machine so uh, power distribution uh, handles uh, the necessary power supply to all the components that are there uh, to the uh, controller, to the uh, drives and other actuators, uh, conveyor belts and uh, so on. Uh, and then the controllers, uh, uh, they are the brains of the operation for the machine. Uh, they have the, uh, the entire programming uh, done so that uh, they send uh, specific commands uh, to the actuators and keep uh, uh, reading the sensor data and then uh, any commands that are sent from uh, HMI and other supervised controller uh, uh, processed and executed uh, by the uh, controller. Then the actuators, uh, uh, they are the ones which do the actual physical uh, movement. So um, uh, they typically include different drives, motors, some hydraulic uh, uh, cylinders, or pneumatic devices, and uh, uh, so on. So uh, in the packing machine, a motor moving a conveyor belt or a hand which uh, closes a, a box uh, or a uh, suction grip which places a cap on a bottle and so on uh, part of the uh, actuator driven actions and then uh, there are sensors they typically uh, provide all the uh, necessary uh, contextual information to the uh, controller uh, different uh, sensors like proximity sensor temperature sensor uh, positioning sensor and so on so uh, they can determine uh, whether uh, a specific uh, product is uh, placed on the belt or uh, in what position it is placed or what is the uh, weight of the material that is being filled in uh, uh, and so on so uh, this sensor data is uh, assigned to the controller and controller makes necessary adjustments by sending specific commands to actuators uh, so that the overall uh, packing process happens. HMIs are where uh, uh, the commands uh, are given by the operators. So uh, um, it allows to start the machine, stop the machine, and make some adjustments to the uh, setting or uh, monitor uh, how the overall machine is performing uh, and so on. So, uh, and then, uh, Communication system, this is where uh, all the different sensors and actuators are talking to the uh, controller, HMI talking to the controller, and then uh, any other uh, supervisory controllers are uh, talking to the uh, 
coming to the controller of this machine uh, and so on. So uh, this is where uh, uh, most of the today's discussion is going to be. It's part of the communication uh, systems and uh, um, related uh, aspects is where uh, we're going to uh, look at in more uh, detail. And of course, these uh, machines have uh, safety systems. So uh, depending on uh, specific application, there can be uh, stop buttons and other safety controllers and so on uh, for safety systems. And end effectors is where uh, you will see the, the final outcome of all these uh, coming uh, together, such as uh, a um, uh, placing a specific uh, product in a specific uh, position or a specific hand uh, closing a box or uh, another roller uh, sealing the uh, box or uh, a specific uh, uh, heat-based uh, cutter uh, cutting and uh, sealing a uh, packing roll and so on uh, you will see as the end effectors so all these uh, components uh, talking to uh, each other and uh, controller uh, being aware of and uh, controlling the actuators and uh, responding to sensor data uh, all makes it uh, work together uh, as a machine great i think i think uh, when no thanks thanks for breaking that down so in terms of uh, let's say uh, just to sort of understand uh, some of the things that uh, you've highlighted here, right? Like in terms of the data flow and the typical scenarios of how these different aspects come together for uh, uh, a specific use case. I think if you can briefly touch yeah. on this, that would be helpful. Yeah. So we have uh, looked at all the different uh, components of a machine and uh, basically what do they do? And then uh, the main and important aspect of this machine is the uh, communication uh, requirements and how uh, all these uh, different components talk to each other. What are the different data flows uh, uh, that are there and uh, uh, and in, in which scenario these data flows occur. So, that, so with this, uh, you will get a complete overview of what a like in a very generic sense, you'll understand uh, what a machine uh, is and how it uh, performs. So uh, sensor data flow, this is where uh, sensors collect data on uh, either product presence or position, weight, dimensions, and so on. And then this data is sent to the uh, controller for processing. This is how controller understands uh, what's going on uh, uh, what's going on on the uh, machine and then uh, controller itself uh, uh, again when it receives this uh, input data uh, it makes decisions on a pre-programmed logic uh, and based on that it generates commands that that needs to be sent to uh, the actuators to perform specific tasks such as uh, uh, moving a product or sealing a package and so on and uh, there is also this uh, feedback data flow uh, where uh, sensors continuously monitor uh, the status of the machine and the uh, products and based on this uh, feedback data flow uh, the controller makes necessary uh, adjustments and corrections uh, on real time so that uh, uh, it allows a little bit threshold of uh, moments and errors uh, here and there to uh, to have a, a dynamic uh, adjustment and to, to make sure that the machine uh, performs uh, seamlessly. And then the HMI data flow, this is uh, basically um, HMI receives data from the PLC and in some cases from sensors uh, as well. Uh, it displays uh, uh, that data for the operators so uh, typical use cases would include like uh, showing some production rates or any uh, error messages or alerts that are uh, raised uh, by the rest of the components on the machine or any uh, maintenance alerts so all these uh, 
I can show up and then the operator can address uh, uh, those. And uh, the data logging and analysis flow, this is uh, uh, where uh, different data logs, uh, uh, including production counts or any uh, downtime events or uh, some error logs, they are all uh, captured. And uh, this data is uh, stored and uh, passed on uh, to analyze so that uh, any trends can be identified and based on that data any optimizations of performance can be done uh, or uh, for any uh, needs uh, to do a, a predictive maintenance related analysis uh, and so on so uh, this is all of this is happening within a machine um, but when there are multiple machines uh, uh, to perform a specific uh, uh, assembling or specific activities on a, a product in, in stages, uh, there is a need uh, for these uh, machines to communicate uh, with uh, each other as well. So the machine to machine data flow uh, usually covers uh, some uh, uh, very good use cases. Like for example, one is uh, automated quality control. So if there is a machine which is only responsible for checking the quality of the uh, products that are coming out. It can give real-time feedback uh, to the uh, producing machine or the packing machine uh, based on the kind of uh, issues that it is detecting and they can be, uh, it can be used again as part of the uh, dynamic adjustment uh, or real-time adjustment that is uh, uh, possible within the threshold of what a uh, controller can do of the uh, producing machine uh, and and it can also another use case is uh, kind of energy optimization so where uh, depending on the current state of uh, the previous machine and uh, this machine and at what rate uh, the production is happening on the previous machine uh, some adjustments can be done to uh, optimize uh, the overall energy consumption so like this there are uh, several use cases uh, that would come into uh, picture. So uh, again, uh, when you look at uh, these data flows for uh, uh, sensor data flow, detect detecting a, a product, and then uh, for the controller to data flow, it, it is uh, mainly processing and sending an, a, a command. And then for the actuator, it is uh, taking an action like sealing a specific uh, uh, box, the moment which is uh, responsible for sealing the box. And, uh, feedback is based on uh, sensor at sealing station confirming that, okay, the position is good and it has been sealed. And then uh, if not based on that, uh, making an adjustment uh, to uh, improve it and so on. And then the monitoring where uh, HMI keeps getting the data with which it can show some alerts and uh, production information and so on uh, to the operator. So uh, I think with these two uh, aspects, that is uh, the different components and the kind of data flows that happens between the components and what kind of uh, uh, scenarios these uh, data flows covers. So with this, we get a high level overview of uh, uh, a machine and how multiple machines on a uh, production line can uh, depend on and talk to each other. Great, perfect. So I think now that we know the the different aspects of how it how these uh, the scenarios or the use cases and the data flows in a typical machine between these blocks, right, that you mentioned, I think uh, it's the right time to sort of uh, get into the the crux of what we wanted to sort of talk today, right, in terms of what it takes to sort of transition towards OPC OAFX, what do machine uh, OEMs have to consider, what does that journey look like? So I think if you can uh, give us uh, a little more of a breakdown into how uh, that that sort of transition happens and uh, and then we can understand the details of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, at least uh, uh, based on some 
example scenarios i'm trying to generalize this uh, so it may not be exactly this approach for every case so it depends on uh, it depends on the composition of uh, the current machine that you are looking at where you are trying to adapt opc uh, fx and uh, it also depends whether you are a machine builder who are trying to adopt OPC FX or you are an OEM who wants to produce a, a, a produce components so that uh, machine builders can adopt OPC FX. So from that perspective, uh, some of these are applicable to you, some of these are not applicable to you. So that judgment I would uh, uh, request the audience to uh, make. Uh, but at a high level, uh, this is what uh, uh, it looks like. So imagine a machine in its current state where um, different uh, components and uh, controllers uh, are uh, used and uh, with uh, different types of uh, physical layers and then uh, different uh, communication uh, protocols, different data models and, and, and so on. And step by step, when we look at it, uh, the first step would be to have a standard Ethernet as a uh, as the physical layer, and then uh, having OPCA enabled uh, for the communication. And of course, uh, that these two steps only uh, provide uh, interoperability to a certain uh, degree, and then going further. Uh, picking and choosing and implementing the right information model based on your application uh, specific use cases and then uh, uh, expanding that to opca fx uh, uh, and then on top of it uh, enabling tsn so this is where opca fx can work in some cases for uh, non-deterministic applications uh, as well and then and you want a full register determinism with um, time bound delivery of the messages, uh, you can have it with uh, um, TSN as the base network on top of which you can have OPC FX. So, from these aspects, uh, we'll just uh, look at how that transition looks like. Uh, this is again uh, uh, in going. Uh, forward in in the subsequent uh, webinars we will uh, cover a little more deeper uh, technically on if you are an oem who is trying to implement opc fx as part of uh, uh, your uh, offerings um, let's say starting with any uh, controller what are the uh, approaches what are the considerations that needs to be taken care hardware considerations platform considerations different stacks that are available how do you uh, make the configuration available to your end users based on your existing uh, configuration tools and infrastructure so all of that in detail we will try to cover in the subsequent uh, um, uh, webinars but today we will look at a uh, uh, little bit higher level uh, on how this uh, transition looks and what are the uh, typical steps uh, uh, more from a machine builder uh, perspective perfect so i think uh, so let's let's go deeper into those uh, five or six steps that you mentioned right like i think uh, that will uh, help us understand where this journey uh, takes us right and, uh, and if you can get into the nitty gritties of how that comes about that would be helpful uh yes so um so he, uh here when you look at uh two machines uh, right uh, so they both have uh so uh in in a sense where you are talking about a machine it is mostly to the uh to the main controller of this machine which has a connection to the uh rest of the plant in terms of connection to a SCADA system. Uh, if you look at from that perspective, there could be uh, different types of uh, physical layers here. And then there could be a different uh, communication protocols that are already available, uh, supported by uh, 
uh, these machines to talk to the outside. And uh, the data, whatever this machine is uh, uh, making it available for the rest of the system, how the data is structured, it also varies depending on uh, uh, the specific uh, communication uh, protocol. So uh, if you want to achieve any level of coordination between uh, these two machines, you need to uh, design a very um, tightly coupled custom solution. So where uh, based on this, that specific register map, you are trying to map, into, map the variables into your uh, uh, application and then uh, similarly you are trying to do the same from the other machine and uh, you're trying to map and based on that you are building the logic to do uh, specific uh, uh, use cases where uh, you can achieve some level of coordination between uh, these two uh, machines so this uh, uh, we can uh, see how this becomes very uh, difficult even for a minor change or if some modifications happens on the uh, register map or uh, uh, the configuration of the controller or the settings of the machine anything uh, it would put again you would need some engineering effort and some customization effort on the uh, solution uh, so uh, here uh, Again, uh, your current machines can be in different uh, stages. So uh, based on you know, the kind of hardware and the kind of uh, uh, support that it already has for OPC and so on. So we will look at it uh, from step-by-step -step, uh, perspective. Uh, assuming that you have a unified physical layer, uh, which is uh, in this case uh, Ethernet, uh, still all the rest of the limitations that I have described earlier uh, are still going to be there. Um, so uh, different protocols, data models being different and still uh, it is a custom uh, build solution. So the only, uh, the only benefit that you would get out of it is the physical layer. You will have the standard uh, Ethernet so that uh, you don't have to deal with multiple types of uh, uh, physical layer and the corresponding uh, uh, connecting and networking components. Um, now, if, if uh, we go to the next step uh, where um, we have uh, uh, controllers where OPC is uh, uh, supported, right? So uh, here again, uh, it um, provides a standard way of uh, connecting to a OPC a server and then gather the data and all that. Uh, but still the information model could be different uh, on each of these machines. So since uh, these are custom built machine and the uh, machine builder may have used components from different uh, OEMs and they might have configured the information model uh, differently uh, for these uh, machines, uh, uh, even including the basics of uh, identifying a machine and uh, its nameplate and so on uh, to that level. So still some customization uh, is uh, required to understand both the information models and uh, to digest that information and provide uh, some level of uh, coordination. Um, but uh, however, uh, uh, if you adapt, uh, to any of these standardized uh, information models uh, as shown in the uh, next slide, uh, then uh, uh, then uh, application can uh, easily understand. So uh, there are uh, several uh, standardized information models are already there um, uh, for machines and uh, even within the uh, machining industry, there are uh, uh, several applications are there. So for each of these type of uh, machine the profiles and information models have been uh, standardized. So for example, uh, if you take a plastic and uh, uh, rubber machinery for extruders so within uh, within the extruder, different types of components. So for the whole thing, they have, there are several information models that have been 
uh, defined for packing machines. So there are information models that have been uh, standardized with uh, PackML and, and so on. So when you use an application um, specific standardized information model as a base uh, for your implementation, then uh, it becomes uh, very easy to understand uh, the information that is coming from these machines, even though they are custom built from different vendors, uh, supporting different features, still uh, you will be able to identify these machines, you'll be able to understand uh, what to uh, ask when you need a specific information and so on. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, some degree of uh, um, uh, M to M coordination can be achieved uh, in a in a better way uh, compared to the uh, previous uh, implementations. Now uh, beyond this, um, instead of simple low PC uh, with information modeling, if you are uh, adopting a controller which has OPC effects uh, built in, then uh, then uh, you, you will be able to establish a direct communication between uh, these two machines. So uh, within the OPC um, FX, uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, rich tools with which you can uh, um, uh, you can uh, define or describe the uh, device, and then you can uh, configure different. Uh, data sets and then uh, define connections to establish uh, uh, between these machines uh, exchanging these data sets so, so the whole uh, workflow is there uh, with which you can establish a machine to machine uh, communication and uh, uh, here uh, different use cases uh, which are uh, not very high demanding in terms of uh, time critical uh, uh, time sensitivity uh, can be achieved with this uh, still using the uh, standard uh, ethernet um, so uh, connection managers can establish uh, um, connections between uh, this machine to uh, machine and uh, uh, any of these uh, use cases like we talked about earlier like an automated uh, quality ch uh, checking machine can give feedback to the producing machine and a producing machine can make necessary adjustments so all of this can happen uh, without the rest of the system getting involved in uh, these uh, lower level coordinated uh, activities and uh, if if the requirements are beyond this and uh, the application demand is to have a complete uh, deterministic and real time uh, data exchange between uh, these machines as well then the Ethernet can be uh, upgraded with uh, support to the TSM uh, based. So once you uh, do that, uh, then you will have a completely deterministic uh, uh, data exchange like it is shown in the uh, next slide. So uh, here, yeah. So. Uh, uh, all the time critical and uh, interoperable controller to controller applications can uh, function directly and uh, any uh, time critical machine to machine uh, data exchange is also becomes uh, uh, possible here uh, here we definitely need to talk a little more on adapting uh, tsm that itself uh, comes with its own uh, uh, few of the uh, challenges where uh, you may have to upgrade some of the uh, networking uh, uh, components uh, in terms of hardware and then uh, you need to be uh, or at least the uh, staff need to be a little more trained on understanding how the TSM network works and if you want to uh, apply determinism for these specific communications uh, what kind of configurations you should uh, do and push uh, to these uh, uh, networking, uh, TSM based networking components and so on. So from uh, that aspect as well, uh, a lot of work is being done where uh, 
automated tools are being developed uh, which can understand the current limitations of bandwidth what is the network segmentation what is the network topology looks like and uh, what kind of uh, uh, data packets with what cycle times uh, needs to be exchanged between uh, two specific nodes within the network so understanding of all these data flows and uh, their bandwidth requirements and uh, cycle time requirements based on all this uh, determining uh, the scheduling configurations and then the uh, timing configurations priority configurations uh, determining these and then being able to push these configurations onto the uh, TSN uh, supporting network components uh, uh, so that uh, the entire network is configured to prioritize uh, these deterministic data flows and the rest of the data can coexist on the network uh, without uh, determinism. So uh, with that, uh, you will have a complete OPC AFX uh, adapted machine to uh, machine uh, communication anything so going further uh, within a machine uh, to achieve the uh, to the same level of uh, determinism again the network uh, uh, within the machine again has to adapt to tsm based uh, networks and then the devices as well should start uh, supporting the opc afx uh, on them uh, that's when even the controller to uh, device and device to compute kind of uh, scenarios as well can be uh, uh, can be operating on the OPC uh, FX based communications. Uh, but uh, um, being able to support uh, machine to machine communication with a controller which supports OPC FX over TSN uh, that itself opens up uh, a lot of uh, 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 additional business use cases, data uh, data driven services, and and so on. Uh, Perfect. I think uh, I think thanks thanks for summing summing up that uh, uh, like six six step from the the initial state in terms of uh, where it could be. Again, like you said, uh, different OEMs uh, could be in different states. Like it could be. Uh, the starting position could be different like in terms of where their current situation is but at the same time uh, all these different aspects are very critical towards arriving at a, a fully functional deterministic opc UAFX implementation right so i think uh, so this this is what we wanted to sort of uh, uh, arrive at in terms of uh, understanding yeah. the different aspects of uh, so uh, even uh, yeah. Um, even from the foundation and the uh, technology standpoint as well, uh, uh, from the OPCFX technology standpoint as well, uh, it is very clear that this will happen uh, gradually and phase by phase. So uh, there are several resources and several uh, accommodations that are being done, uh, being provided as part of the uh, technology specification and other uh, aspects uh, which would accommodate for you to have these hybrid networks and hybrid infrastructures where components supporting OPC AFX, uh, components supporting uh, TSN and OPC AFX or TSN can coexist with uh, rest of the uh, systems and uh, still work as a subsystem and then integrate to the rest of the systems and, and so on. So. Uh, this this actually uh, makes it uh, much uh, easier to uh, start the adaptation journey and uh, uh, do a gradual uh, adaptation uh, step by step perfect i think yeah thanks thanks for summing up that cp i think uh, uh, we uh, we've consolidated what we wanted to i think uh, uh, and and yeah, I think moving forward, we'll be getting into a little more details. And I think uh, so. Uh, so the following session is 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 really getting into the networks itself, right? The network and the topology and how that comes together uh, from an OP OPC UFX standpoint. So I think we'll be doing this in a couple of weeks again. And uh, 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 
and and before that like if you have any questions specific to this uh, feel free to use the, the comment section as well as uh, the opcua uh, fx professionals group that we have on linkedin as well so uh, uh, anytime uh, the respective as uh, subject matter experts can can sort of address your queries and uh, any questions you may have on that front so happy to sort of keep it engaged and uh, and sort of address any points that you might have right and uh, we'll continue to sort of uh, um, share insightful information of where it's where this technology stands today and uh, and and different aspects associated to the different gradual uh, steps to going about this journey and, uh, and and i'm sure those might be helpful for you whenever you sort of uh, uh, look at this aspect so um so yeah, I think I'll conclude the session for today. And uh, again, this 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 uh, webinar series is is a collaboration with uh, BNR Automation and uh, Standard Electric, and uh, we we sort of encourage uh, different OEMs to sort of uh, uh, collaborate and contribute towards this initiative. And I think uh, the more the merrier. And uh, and if anyone would like to sort of uh, understand more, happy to sort of. Uh, uh, get in touch and, and sort of go about this. So again, uh, it was fantastic uh, hearing from you, CP. I think uh, thanks again. And uh, we hope to have another insightful session in a couple of weeks. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time and, uh, and being with us for about an hour. And uh, we'll definitely see you soon in a couple of weeks. And uh, any questions in between, feel free to drop it in and we'll get back to you. Thanks again. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.